it is a critical thing to understand the energy cycle because microphysical process in included the phase change of water, which is ultimately drive the storm. So I believe that this will make a huge impact how we study storms in the future. This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm Nate Potker. As technology advances and new tools are developed, researchers can learn things in innovative ways and from different perspectives. The National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR, is working to understand and advance Earth system science. Our guest today is Wen Chao Li, senior scientist at NCAR's Earth Observing Laboratory and APAR chief scientist, who has spent his career studying storms, often from inside or in close proximity to them. Dr. Lee, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my pleasure. I want to ask you a little bit about radar and the kind of different forms. Like we know about kind of the ship style one that's like a little beeping kind of situation. And we know about satellites nowadays. Are there kind of quality and difference of the data from the different kinds of radar? I, I would say a different quality. Uh, I, I think we... We can look at different type of radar on different platform as looking at the same features from different perspective, from different platform. Uh, for example, a tropical cyclone over the ocean can be observed by your ship or radar. Uh, you certainly don't want that ship to be too close to the center of the storm. It would be very dangerous. Uh, we have radar on the aircraft, which uh, it's able to penetrate the storm. And we also have radar on a satellite, which observe the tropical cyclone from above. So those are complementary tools that can uh, observe the same feature from different angles. And each type of radar, uh, the radar with different platform, uh, has advantages and disadvantages because of the location of the platform of radar relative to the storm. So uh, in general, uh, radars transmit a radar beam, which has a, what we call a pencil beam, that has a beam width. Uh, so just like the head of a pencil. So as the radar beam moves further away from the radar, it actually expands in space. So if we can get closer to the storm, the resolution will be much better. So those are some, some differences in, uh, uh, in how we can sample a storm and how we get, uh, uh, how we visualize a storm uh, from different platforms. I know there's a, a lecture that you gave that's on the internet that you can watch where you're talking about and you show some clips of flying into storms. Um, what can you learn only from that position? A remote sensor uh, like radar, uh, LIDAR, or, or uh, other uh, passive remote sensing, it, uh, it's very similar uh, to when we visit a, a physician and you get an MRI, you get an X-ray. Uh, the reason the doctors want to use those instruments to examine our body is they can look inside our body much better than their eyes just to look at it outside. Probing a storm is is a, a, is a similar analogy. So if we can probe inside a storm and understand how the storm behave, look like, it, it will give the scientists a much better idea how we can better model the storm. Because the weather prediction uh, in, in, in nowadays, it, it's, it's, it's rely on numerical weather prediction. And numerical weather models uh, basically translate the, the physics of the atmosphere into computer codes, from the mathematics, physics, into computer code. So if we can better describe the storm, we can better formulate the equation, and down the road, we can improve the model forecast. 
we can sample the detail of a storm in a way that uh, we could help to the, 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 the scientists to understand the physical processes or microphysical processes better. That's why we need to be in the storm, uh, get much closer to the storm. And I, I think my next question sort of elaborates on that same topic, probably. What can we learn better with more advanced tools? Is, is there more information beyond just the better resolution or better quality data? I think better resolution is the the key. Uh, another analogy I, I like pe- I like to use often is like a digital camera. Okay, if, if you use a uh, when with a digital camera, the Sony digital camera first uh, appeared in the market, it used a floppy disk, three point three and a half inch floppy disk, and the resolution that I remember was probably one megapixel, and the picture looks pretty good. But nowadays, it, uh, your cell phone can take a picture of what twenty megapixel, which is twenty times better resolution, and and the the person uh, appear on the picture will 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 have much more details. Uh, yeah, and 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 it's, it's the same thing as how we use radar to send for a storm. We want to fly into the storm so we can probe the storm in a much more detail fashion so we can understand the detail of how the storm works and the the other thing that it's important is that when we fly into the storm uh, there are in situ measurement not just a radar we can probe the actual wind speed of the storm at the flight level and also we can uh, use drop cell which is a, a radio cell that was a parachute that we can release when we're flying through the storm. So it will record a wind direction, wind speed as it falls. And most importantly, we often use the drop sound to measure the central pressure. Would a tool like that be useful in, say, a tornado? Or do they, is it too destructive? We, we don't like to penetrate tornado. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, yeah, it, you, you can do it only once, I guess. <laughs> uh, so uh, in, in tornado, Type of study we we we, we use a different uh, different approach. We we don't fly into the storm, but we fly as close we can. If we have uh, two Doppler radars looking at a storm at the same time, then we can deduce the three dimensional wind field from two loops of the Doppler radar. And for the airborne radar, basically we transmit two beams one forward, one aft. So as the aircraft move forward, any point in space will first be sampled by the forward radar, then a few minutes later, it will be sampled by the aft radar. So that's how we collect uh, three-dimensional wind field data f- well, I- within tornado or, or within uh, tropical cycle. Now, one of the, the big funding projects that started up this year was something called APAR, the Airborne Phase Array Radar. Uh, so conventional radar, they, when they say Doppler radar or Doppler 1000 uh, type of radar, it, they use a parabolic antenna. APAR is termed Airborne Phase Array Radar. So the radar technology, we adopted a uh, more advanced technology called phased array radar. A uh, phased array radar is a a new generation of the radar technology which does not use a parabolic antenna. It uses uh, semiconductor chips. Those chips using your cell phone. And phased array radar has a, a, a several advantages. The first one is. Uh, the current airborne Doppler radar uh, cannot be upgraded to have dual polarization capability. Why dual polarization is important? A conventional radar or a Doppler radar measures the reflectivity, which is a reference of the intensity of a storm. Then well, the radar also collects the Doppler velocity, which is a relative motion between the rain particle 
and the radar. Dual polarization means a radar transmit horizontal polarized wave and a vertical polarized wave. It's the direction of the electric field. And we know raindrops has different shapes from circle, circular to more of an oblate shape. And reflectivity itself cannot distinguish the shape of the raindrops. But if we implement the dual polarization capability, the horizontal polarized wave and the vertical polarized wave will cut through a precipitation particle in two directions. So in a circular uh, raindrop, the return will be very, very similar or identical from the two polarized but for an oblate uh, uh, raindrop, which is typically as larger, bigger raindrops, the horizontal polarized reflectivity will be larger than the vertical polarized wave because the cross sections are different. So if the, the dual polarization capability adds a lot more information about the microphysical properties within a storm, so those information has been proven, shown, and demonstrated useful by the ground-based radar. And so the scientists, the research community, and also the operational community are dying to, ha to have that capability on the airborne radar. But that is also a challenging problem because the depolarization part hasn't been done by the military. So it is a brand new development for a whole new area, a whole, whole yes. new kind of approach. Right. What are the challenges in implementing that? Phase three radar, I give you an example. A conventional radar is a sequential scanning, so it just spins over and over again. For a thunderstorm, it typically occupies a very small sector of the atmosphere. So quite often, maybe 80%, 70% of the time, a radar will, will scan clear rather than the storm itself. So it, it's not very effective or efficient. But phase array radar technology uh, is not enables AGR scanning so we can digitally control where the beam is pointing. So it, it's not limited to a sequential scanning anymore. So effectively, we can sample the storm, we'll get focused on the storm, uh, compare it with conventional radar. So in a unit time, uh, we can get more samples of, of a single storm than the conventional radar. Right, because instead of going sequential, it's directed specifically where you want it, right. or less. Right. Um, is that a lot more data to take in? Like I'm, I'm thinking about some of the computational challenges that could happen with uh, that. Not necessary. Not necessarily uh, uh, more data, but more useful data. Mm -hmm. Because the the uh, if if seventy percent of your data is in clear, which is not of meteorological interest. A clear air is also an interest for, for some scientists, but for, for severe weather or high impact weather, we, we want to study storms. So effectively, the the phase wave radar will give you more data in the storm than in the area where it's not relevant or related to with the high impact weather. What is the timeline for deploying that? The National Science Foundation just grant, uh, awarded a $91.8 million grant to NCAR to build the airborne phaser radar. So this phaser, uh, airborne phaser radar will consist of panels, active elect electronic scanning pa uh, array panel mounted on the fuselage of the C-130 aircraft. So by June 2028, uh, the radar should be ready for uh, deployment. What aspect of APAR coming together are you most excited about? The ability to revolutionize 
the science discovery is is probably the most exciting thing for me. About 20 years ago, uh, my colleague Everett Lowe and I, in a casual conversation, we sort of uh, uh, joked about, hey, what, what if we put uh, a few uh, face rate panels on the NCAR C-130? Can we do that? That may be a game changer. But the reason I said that was uh, the three-fourths or two-thirds of the Earth are ocean. Uh, only a few islands sprinkle eh, over the ocean. And, and the majority of the ocean um, is not even close to an island. Other than airborne radar or satellite or radar, spaceborne radar, there, there's no other ways to sample or the probe inside of a storm. From tropical cyclone, the uh, uh, most recently very uh, uh, hot topic is the atmospheric river associated with the uh, intense cold frontal system that impinge on the west west coast of of, uh, of the United States. So a big part of the high impact weather that in, influence the uh, people's life over land have their orig uh, origins over the ocean, where ground-based radar is not effective. So the exciting thing about airborne radar is that the aircraft can fly thousands of miles away from the coastline and sample those storms and bring the data back the satellite communication to the uh, weather center for the forecaster to analyze the storm structure. We can also use the data as the initial or boundary condition uh, into numerical weather prediction model. Being able to add the depolarization capability to probe into a more detail microphysical structure in a storm. It is a critical thing to understand the energy cycle, how the how the energy was transported in the storm. Because microphysical process in, included the phase change of water, which is ultimately drive the storm. So I believe that this will make a huge a major impact. Absolutely. And, and making that impact have the work to become the thing that actually develops and is used by people is really like gives you a sense of right. accomplishment there. This technology, if we are successful of building it, has a research to operation possibility. This technology cannot just help in the U.S. to probe the storm in the Atlantic or, or Eastern Pacific. It has a potential to uh, assist the Western Pacific in terms of typhoon uh, in Australia, in Indian uh, Indian Ocean cyclone. Uh, so uh, I'm very excited about the potential of uh, this capability. Special thanks to Win Chow Lee for the Discovery Files. I'm Nate Potker. Please subscribe wherever you get podcasts, and if you like our program, share with a friend and consider leaving a review. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.